Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second online Storytime webinar. I'm Phoebe Weston Evans. I'm overseeing the online Storytime program, and I'm speaking to you from the land of the Ngunnawal and the Gambri people, whom I acknowledge as the traditional custodians of this land, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present at today's session. Um, please use the chat and let us know and acknowledge the traditional lands that you're joining from today. The session is being recorded and I will send out a link to the recording after the session and um, you can use the chat too to post any questions or comments to the panelists at any stage and we will get to them at the end. Um, in May this year, Alia President Vicky Edmonds set the very important theme of diversity for her presidential tenure and we are very grateful to Vicky for hosting today's session. Um, so I'll be handing over to you now Vicky and you can introduce our wonderful panellists. Uh, thank you so much, Phoebe. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm on Darug and Gundungurra lands and pay my deepest respect to Elders past and present while recognising the strength, capacity and resilience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in our various regions. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us for this webinar, which focuses on creating inclusive story times for our public library communities and how to incorporate inclusive practices into the online story environment. My ALIA presidential theme of diversity is also a strategic priority for ALIA in our 2020 to 2024 strategic plan, supporting a resilient, diverse workforce, attracting and developing talented, committed individuals from different cultural backgrounds who will have the strength and agility to navigate a rapidly changing workplace. This theme is a goal within the Professional Pathways Initiative, and I hope will support libraries to increase diversity within their workforces and help develop libraries' roles as culturally safe places. We are collectively growing our awareness of diversity and inclusion and public libraries in particular are embracing diversity as a principle that guides programming, service provision, collections, management and outreach. We are increasingly aware that creating inclusive environments and embracing diversity only makes us stronger and more resilient as individuals and as a society. In this webinar, we are very lucky to be joined by a number of experts who will share their experience and insights from different areas. They will be talking about raising awareness of diversity, the impact of early literacy, elements of sensitive story times and universal design principles to support creating inclusive and accessible online story times. First of all, we have Nadia Rutley from Brisbane City Council who will introduce the presentation made by her team. Nadia is the coordinator reading at Brisbane City Council Library Service where she has worked for over 12 years. Nadia oversees reading and early literacy programming including First Five Forever. CBC, a book week and lit literary events across the 33 libraries in the council's library service. Secondly, we have Kylie Carson from Yarra Libraries in Melbourne. Kylie is a senior coordinator, community engagement and partnerships at Yarra Libraries and has a keen interest in inclusive programming and services. Kylie introduced sensitive story times inclusive story times and sensitive Santa sessions to Yarra Plenty and Yarra Libraries and has also trained another library services in facilitating these programs. She and her team have worked tirelessly through the Melbourne lockdowns to bring books, food, internet connection and all kinds of support and resources to people in need. She is a Libraries Change Lives advocate and is passionate about sharing the difference the difference that libraries make to people's lives each and every day. And then lastly, we will hear from Jo Keating. Jo splits her time between the University of South Australia where she lectures in the Master of Information Management and Adelaide Hills Council, where she is programs team leader and children's librarian. She is interested in universal design and inclusive practice in public libraries for children with disabilities and their families. She received the South Australian Catherine Helen Spence Scholarship, Public Libraries of South Australia Rod East Memorial Award, and the Australian Library and Information Association Twilla Ann Jansen Her Award. 
So we are certainly in expert hands this, uh, yeah, this afternoon. So first of all, over to Nadia to introduce your team and their presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as um, I was introduced, I'm Nadia Rutley. I'm the coordinator of re reading for Brisbane Libraries. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm presenting from today, which is the Yuggera and Turrbal people, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today and look forward to learning together. Unfortunately, Andrea Hurley and Marlene Westervelle could not be here today, but they have pre-recorded their session for you, and I have the joy of introducing them. To give you a very short background, in 2015, the State Government of Queensland launched First Five Forever, which is a family literacy initiative coordinated by the State Library of Queensland and delivered in partnership with local government. When we received this funding here at Brisbane Libraries, we were able to double our early literacy early literacy sessions of baby books and rhymes, toddler time and story time across our 33 libraries, which um, pre-COVID was at about 225 per week that we did. Um, but it also gave us some space to investigate other ways of improving our offering in the family literacy environment. An opportunity came up in 2015 to work with a small team at Griffith University on a project that focused on early literacy for children on the autism spectrum and their families. Andrea Hurley, our first Five Forever coordinator here at Brisbane Libraries, worked very closely with Marlene Westerfeld, a senior lecturer in speech pathology at Griffith Uni and her team over five or so years. And you'll see some of their findings here today in the presentation. Out of this project, we've been able to, to develop a fantastic training package that is free for anyone who is interested. You'll see more details about this at the end of their presentation. So I hope you find it really helpful and please get in touch with us if you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, and I will start sharing their presentation. Um, and can everybody see that? Okay. Welcome. My name's Marlene Westerveld and I'm an Associate Professor in Speech Pathology at Griffith University. And with me here today is Andrea Hurley, the first Five Forever Coordinator for Brisbane City Council. We're very excited to present to you today about creating inclusive online story times. Let's get started. So what about literacy, autism and library story times? What we know is that preschoolers on the autism spectrum are at increased risk of persistent long-term literacy difficulties. We also know that preschool learning experiences in the home and community provide such a valuable opportunity to promote early language and literacy skills. However, parents with preschoolers on the autism spectrum have concerns about the suitability of the library environment to meet the needs of their child. And that is based on a quite a large scale survey that we conducted about 18 months ago. So librarians and autism. Research has indicated that librarians require more knowledge, training and experience to include children with additional needs into story time sessions. When we piloted the face-to-face -face training um, with library staff here in Brisbane, they indicated that they had limited knowledge around early literacy training and about including children with additional needs into their sessions. Research indicates that library staff are keen to include children with additional needs, including children on the autism spectrum, into story time, but find they rarely attend the sessions. There are also findings that library staff are willing to make adjustments and accommodate children with additional needs in story time. In 2013, it was determined that autism was a spectrum condition. People on the autism spectrum need different levels of support and are no longer classified as high or low functioning. The condition has a dyad that includes social communication needs and restricted 
and repetitive behaviours. Often people on the autism spectrum have co-occurring conditions, which Marlene will talk about shortly. Yes, yeah, so ha let's have a quick look at um, ASD or autism spectrum disorder. And as Andrea just said, the um, core conditions or challenges in people on the autism spectrum are social communication in purple on the left and repetitive and restrictive behaviors in red on the right. And as you can see, um, these social communication difficulties may present as challenges in social emotional reciprocity, nonverbal communication, and forming of relationships. And there are also different ways in which repetitive and restrictive behaviors can manifest themselves. What is important, as Andrea just po pointed out, that we look at the different levels of support that these children may um, need in both social communication and restricted and repetitive behaviours. And you may have heard of levels of support ranging from one to three, with level three indicating that um, very substantial support is needed. Then if we quickly look at co-occurring conditions, these are actually a rule rather than ex and an exception. And most commonly we find um, ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, intellectual disability, mood disorders and or anxiety disorders, um, and then it says epilepsy. But what we're particularly interested in or have, have focused on are the high incidence of language disorders. Um, and that's up to about 30% of children will um, demonstrate some language difficulties. We've also discovered that many children on the spectrum have reading or literacy impairments, and this can be up to 30 or 50% of children who will demonstrate difficulties in either decoding, so recognizing the, the words on a page, or comprehension. So let's look at early literacy skills and in children on the autism spectrum. We know that the ultimate aim of learning to read is reading comprehension. We want to know what it means what we read. And um, so for that to occur, we need good word recognition. We need to decode the words on a page and we need good oral language comprehension to really understand what these written words mean. We know that children develop their literacy foundation skills from birth. What we know about children on the spectrum is that they often show strengths in letter knowledge. So they may know all the letters of the alphabet, but not always. We also know that really often they show challenges in comprehension. So some of these children may be super readers, super decoders, but may have real difficulties understanding what all the words they're reading beautifully actually mean. Which leads us to, let's have a quick look at autism friendly evidence based practices that we can utilize in everyday life um, to help these children learn or access learning. So the first one is antecedent based interventions. So the goal of these types of interventions is to identify factors that are reinforcing certain interfering behaviors. So for example, if we conduct a story time session, we may find that the child starts screaming. What we want to do is we want to understand why that might be happening so that we can then modify the environment or the activity to make sure that this behavior doesn't occur which has really um, led us to look at doing an environmental audit to support engagement. Another um, frequently used evidence-based practice is the use of visual supports, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but these include, for example, visual schedules or social stories. Now, if you're interested in getting more information on any of these or other evidence-based practices, we really highly recommend that you visit the AFFIRM um, website, which offers you um, professional learning development modules free of charge. But how would we adapt these kind of um, evidence-based practices to suit the online environment? And that's what we've come here today to talk to you about. So what we want to do is we want to prepare the inclusive environment as much as we can so that it's accessible to all children, including those on the autism spectrum. And that's been such a wonderful um, 
bit of feedback that we've received and that librarians told us. They said, oh, actually, our sessions are great for all kids, including kids who have English as a second language or children with language disorders or everyone really who attends our story time sessions. So we wanted to just get across that this is not going to be specifically for children on the autism spectrum, but it will make it easier for these children to access um, the content. So we want to make sure it's evidence based. We want to incorporate some of these antecedent based interventions and Andrea will show you um, examples of an environmental audit. We want to include visual supports as much as we can, including a schedule and props. We also want to have a quick look at the choice of books and that really then links in with the types of language difficulties or reading comprehension difficulties that we often find in slightly older children on the autism spectrum. Andrea. Thanks, Marlene. Um, so what you can see now um, on your screen is an environmental checklist that we designed in the um, training. Um, of course, the checklist was designed for face-to-face -face delivery, but there are um, some items that we've included on our environmental checklist in the training package that will apply to the online environment. So you can see some of the examples that are there. So um, having a think about visuals, what does what does the um, the screen look like um, in the online environment? Are there busy areas behind the storyteller? Um, so are there lots of busy things happening there that could be distracting to children? Um, visual distractions. Um, are there any redundant visual displays? Um, is there a designated area where the visual supports can be placed during your delivery? So a lot of those things are relevant too for the online environment. Noise, you need to think about noise. Are there competing noises happening? Um, are there less obvious competing noises during the story time? Now you might have noticed my lights have gone off in my room here. <laughs> so you've probably seen me in the dark. So that can be a visual distraction as well. Thanks, Marlene. <laughs> now, um, this is a checklist that we designed um, in the training for uh, our storytelling sessions. Um, and the sorts of things that you would need to consider um, are listed here on this checklist, which is also part of our training package. But these things can be very easily adapted to the online environment as well. So um, does your session follow the same structure every time is something to consider. Is there a clear commencement of the session? For example, do you start your session with a welcome song, with an acknowledgement to country um, consistently? Do children know what's going to happen next? So we really recommend using something that Marlene's just talked about called a visual schedule, and we'll show you some examples of those. And you can use that very easily in the online environment. Does the sequence of activities accommodate different levels of attention? So do you alternate between reading and moving around? So you might sing some action songs and things like that to get children up and moving during your delivery. Is there a clear finish to the storybook reading time? Is there a clear transition? If you're doing anything afterwards, obviously in the face-to-face -face environment, we do a craft or a mark making experience and there needs to be a clear transition to that. You may not do that in the online environment, but you may choose to. Um, but it's really important that you have a clear transition to that next activity. Um, giving children time to respond to the questions. So in an online environment, asking children questions, of course, is going to stimulate their oral language. Um, wait for a response. Don't just start on the next thing. Have a pause so that children have time to respond. And are instructions or directions presented one step at a time as you're moving through your session? So here we have a couple of examples for you of um, visual schedules. So you might like to have a think about which one of these visual schedules you prefer, which one looks clearer, 
which one looks busier um, because that can be a distraction um, to children, particularly in the online environment. So the two examples we have here, um, one of them, the one on the left uh, with the Griffith University logo is one that all of our libraries across Brisbane are using at the moment. Um, and the one on the right was developed by our team at Ashgrove Library when they piloted um, the delivery of the autism friendly story time session. So visual schedules are really important because they give children an idea of what's going to happen in the session and when the session is going to end. So they have some predictability about what's going to happen. Um, and this can help children to understand how long they're expected to be sitting in the story time session. And that's, of course, very important in the online environment as well. So we're just going to show you a brief clip um, of Jess demonstrating the visual schedule. I'm just aware of time. Um, and um, look at this lovely background that these people in the library um, presented. It's lovely and clear, not a lot of distraction. So let's have a look at Jess. Hi, everyone. Let's look at what we're going to do today. Let's look at our pictures. We're going to start with our Hello song. Next, we're going to do children's acknowledgement of country. Then we're going to do our song of open, shut them. Then our other song of happy and you know it. Then we're going to read a story. Then we're going to do bear went over the mountain. Then we're going to sing teddy bear, teddy bear. And then we're all finished and it's time to go home. And when we finish each thing, we're going to put them in the box that way. <laughs> So here we've got some examples of some visual supports that staff in our, in our library have used um, when they were piloting um, autism friendly story time session. So you can see there the three little pigs, um, some beautiful visuals for children to help retell the story after the story had been shared with them. Um, then you can see there's a, um, some pictures of different emotions which went really, really well um, with the very cranky bear, um, you know, where staff could retell the story and really identify, talk with the children about how the bear was feeling. And you can see there very well the expression on his face and which one it matches with. So visual schedule or visual supports are really, really important, um, especially with children on the autism spe spectrum. We also have um, a number of bookmarks that we design for parents to take home after story time session. Um, and you'll find these bookmarks in the training that we have developed, um, which we will tell you about how you can access that a little bit later on. Um, but these um, strategies are very, very easy to use in your story time sessions online. Um, these are some things that you can do in your online sessions um, to really, I guess, resonate with children um, the importance of words. So pointing out new words, things like bundled, grinned, furious, crept and galloping, pointing them out in the story, providing definitions for children. So expanding on the words so that they really have some comprehension and understanding of what they mean. So furious means very angry. Grinned means a big smile. And use gestures and facial expressions in your delivery to demonstrate word meanings. So making a scared face or demonstrate huff and puff and using your fingers, showing children how to creep. Relating words to children's own life experience. So things like that wolf does that wolf look like if you have a dog, you might think that wolf looks a little bit like your dog. Does your dog look like that wolf? Um, you might copy what your child says or what children say or asking parents actually to copy what children say so that they know um, that parents are understanding what they're saying and repeating new words throughout the story. Very important because um, we know repetition helps children to remember. 
So book selection. So what types of books um, are most suitable for children on the autism spectrum? Well, we know that narrative stories really help children to comprehend behaviours in the story and why it's occurring. So you'll see there um, what's in a narrative structure, in a narrative story structure, the elements that are in that story are the characters, the setting, there's usually a problem, a plan to resolve the problem, actions to resolve the problem, the resolution of the problem and an ending. That's right. And we used um, a story grammar map, we call that, or a story structure map like that with some of the um, slightly older children just to refer back to like, oh, who were the characters in this story? Or, oh, where were they when the story started? So, um, yeah. So um, in our training, we shared a list of books, parents of children on the autism spectrum recommended, and these really helped us to decide what sorts of resources or books to share as examples. So you can see um, the examples we have here. So these are very good narrative stories um, to include in autism inclusive storytelling sessions. And I've also put a link up here. It's a little um, plug for a speech pathologist. Again, it's a free um, site where she regularly puts up other books that um, adhere to a really sort of nice story structure and it's called books true narrative structure so you may be interested in just having a quick look at that that brings us to the end please have a look at the free training we have developed to support librarians with including children on the autism spectrum into story times we piloted this first and then created an online version you can access this training by scanning the barcode if you're quick, <laughs> or by visiting my website where we have made it available for now. You'll be able to learn more about autism, emergent literacy and autism, and how to adapt your story time session to make them autism friendly. It will basically cover all the content that we have zoomed through today in a self-paced manner. You'll also be able to download a wealth of resources, some of which we highlighted today. Finally, we acknowledge the financial support from the Autism C CRC and my heartfelt thanks to all our collaborators. That's all from us. Thank you for listening. Well, wow, thank you, Nadia. That was so interesting. I've just got so many takeaways from that. I know we're short for time, so I'm going to hand straight over to Kylie. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm just going to share my screen and hope that you can see it and that everything's going to work. Can we all see that screen? Yep, that looks good. Yep, no worries. So I'll just start with the acknowledgement. Yarra City Council acknowledges, acknowledges the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people as our traditional owners and true sovereigns of the land now known as Yarra. We also acknowledge the significant contributions made by other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to life in Yarra. We pay our respects to elders from all nations here today and to the elders past, present and future. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to talk to you more from my, I guess, parents' point of view and also from working in libraries' point of view as well. This is my son, Jonah. Uh, at the time this photo was taken, he was three and he had been banned from almost every program I tried to take him to, like Jimbaroo and all the rest of it, because Jonah is diagnosed with uh, autism, ADHD, dyspraxia and also anxiety disorder, to give you a bit of an idea of what I'm dealing with as a parent. And he's delightful. <laughs> but uh, he has come with his challenges and has really uh, shaped my life and the way I look at programming in libraries and also um, just our general environment out there in the community. So I'm going to talk about the why. It's really important, I think, when we talk about these programs to remember our community, remember the families that are coming in and remember the children that are coming into your programs. This is my why, this is my Jake and my Jonah. 
And ASD, and a, a common um, saying with autism is if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. It's very important not to generalise and stereotype kids on the spectrum, because just like you and I, they are their own little person and they have their own personality and their own quirks. They all have similarities and they have uh, things that, that do uh, make them similar, but they are very different as well. Autism is an invisible disability. To look at my children, you wouldn't know that they have a disability. Um, and that often is a struggle for them navigating the world and also is a struggle for you as a parent because it, if my child's not obviously got a disability, it's often harder for people around me to understand when they have meltdowns or if they act out or if they have a reaction to something. Often people look at you and say, what's wrong with your child? Are they a brat? Are they naughty? What's wrong with them? So um, this picture in particular is important to me because the boys look very, very happy. But Jonah had a massive meltdown. This, is, this was uh, getting on a boat down the Yarra River. And after this photo was taken, he spent the whole time screaming and yelling and terrified because he was so anxious on the boat. So you just, you know, looks can be deceiving. So this is a typical story time. When I started working in Mill Park Library at Yarra Pliny, uh, these were the types of crowds and numbers we were getting to story times three times a day, five days a week. So that's pretty overwhelming. And you'll find that a lot of library services in those growth corridors are typically dealing with crowds like this. These crowds are absolutely huge. And what you will find sometimes is when you're dealing with a big crowd, you'll notice children running around, not being able to sit on the mat, climbing under your chair, climbing behind your chair. I should say too, I've managed libraries and I run lots of events and programs. I'm not a children's librarian. I've worked very, very closely with our children's librarians. Um, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit uh, later on as well. So, but this is what a lot of children's librarians are facing and they do a really good job to be presenting um, to these sorts of crowds all the time. So I started looking at this and started talking to families. And this was quite overwhelming for parents and for children trying to access essential, essential services like story times. So when we look at new types of programming, um, I've always used design thinking frameworks and principles. So understanding and empathizing with what a person is experiencing in an environment, start to explore and define and create new ideas to actually help with some of those uh, issues that might have been identified. We were always getting parents coming up saying these story times are too big, too noisy, my child can't cope. This is not conducive for learning and not conducive for being at, at the library. Then you start to take, uh, take community feedback and start to develop or create some, some ways of uh, helping resolve those issues. And then it's really important to test and then evaluate. And so we started off, and I'll talk to you, we started off as sensitive story times, but we actually then started to move our sensitive story times into a more inclusive story time model. So some of the feedback that we got was a lot of parents felt that their diagnosis had left them very isolated. I can really relate to this. I had the children that couldn't uh, with dyspraxia. My kids can't kick footballs. They can't coordinate. It took them many years to later on in life to be able to even ride a bike. So if you imagine navigating uh, school with, with two boys when People typically expect them to play football or basketball or, you know, run around the playground. That was not my children. So often you do feel isolated because a lot of social groups and gatherings happen in places that are not conducive for your children. Uh, there's a lot of stigma around ASD and a lot of parents don't like to die, like uh, tell people that their children have a diagnosis because they're scared of what people will think. So this is the sort of stories that we were starting to get. I was starting to approach families with children that were actually having tantrums or finding the library environment too hard. And these were the sort of stories we were getting. 
obviously uh, going through early intervention programs with both of my boys with their diagnosis, you work very closely with others, mothers groups, and you work with experts in the field. And as a parent, you often become a bit of an expert yourself. So how do we create new experiences and approaches to your library programming? It's really about consulting with your community and finding out what's best for them, talking to your local experts as well. What we introduced at uh, Yarra Plenty and then it's uh, continued in Yarra Library Services, where I am now, is we created sensitive story times or quiet story times. We, we set those story times at different times of the day. We consulted with the community. We made them in the afternoon afternoon in quieter rooms and more controlled environments. So looking at the environment and making it a lot more predictable, calmer and quieter for your families. Um, I won't share the videos, but we, um, Phoebe is going to share all the links. We've actually got a whole story about how sensitive story times, times came together and also working with our peak body amaze in Victoria. Um, and we've also got links to online um, training that we've developed with them as well that is all free for you. So sensitive versus inclusive. I think this is going back to that design thinking model. As we continued with sensitive story time, I think what's really important is often the children's librarians got frustrated because it doesn't attract a big crowd. They were used to these big crowds and then all of a sudden we went to sensitive story times and they were only having two or three children coming and they're like, my manager's not going to support this because I'm not getting the numbers. Sometimes we get very hung up on numbers. It's really important to understand that that's exactly what you want is smaller numbers, that more one-on-one -on -one, uh, work with families. But what we have realised is sometimes, and this photo is significant because sometimes the children and the parents don't want a separate story time. They actually just want to assimilate and be with everybody else. So what we started to do was keep tweaking and working with our families. And what we would do is actually start them off in sensitive story time uh, environments in the hope that we could then build them up to actually be part of the normal story time sessions. Because this is what you want to do as a parent. You want your child to be able to exist in the world. You can't always have separate sessions for your child in ASD. The world doesn't work like that. You actually need to assimilate into the community and into your environments at school and everywhere else. So what we would do is we do these special sessions with the real uh, aim and hope to get children to be able to go into our normal story time sessions with everybody else because you don't want to feel separate from everyone for the rest of your life as well and I can my children have uh, shared that and uh, I've obviously felt it as a parent as well. So what are the basics? Uh, we heard in the presentation before about these are PEX cards. This is what we use for schedule boards. It is the universal language for people with disabilities. These are very useful for adults, for anybody. So um, you can easily get these online for free or you can buy uh, the program called Boardmaker. Uh, most parents actually have access to this through their NDIS plans if, if they're aware their kids are on the spectrum, but you can access these very easily. So how does the schedule board look? You saw some great examples from Queensland Library. Here's an example of how you can do it on a, um, on a board. And the finish box is really important. You'll notice the box at the top, that's the universal symbol for finish. So as activities come off the board, we put them into the finish box as well. A visual timer is really, really good. You can buy these for $90. Um, they're not expensive. Uh, we've actually incorporated these timers into, I use, I live and die by this. I use this on my husband as well. So these are a great thing to have in the kitchen. It has an alarm on it um, and it's great. Children on the spectrum, and my boys in particular, have no concept of time. So often tantrums can happen when they don't know their time is up. 
the way uh, my doctors um, explained it to me was imagine Kylie you're watching a really good TV show because often kids on the spectrum have hyper focus so they get very involved and they lose a sense of what's going on around them so imagine you're watching a movie and you're right up to the right up to the uh, cliffhanger bit and somebody turns that movie off on you how are you going to react you're not going to be happy right but that's where visual timers are really important for children on the spectrum because you can say in 15 minutes that movie is finishing or this story time is finishing or this activity is finishing. So it's a really useful tool. And we also embedded it into our Lego clubs and after school programming as well. So um, and parents have even said that's really good for me too. It keeps me on track. So the other sorts of things you can in incorporate into your story times are sensory items. You can have tents like these tents, which have mesh um, backing so the kids can still watch uh, the story times, but they can feel like they're in a safer space. I've used so many of these pop-up tents with my boys. It's a safe space and you can put some cushions in there as well. At the start of each story time, we have all of these aids and kits behind our storyteller and we sort of announce to people if they want them, come and grab them. So it's an opt-in, opt-out um, type situation. You can also get sensory cushions. These are fantastic, especially for children with ADHD, which both my boys have. It actually um, it works with pressure points and can actually help them sit and settle. So these aren't very expensive as well. They're about $60 to purchase. Other things that you can incorporate is inclusive activities. Often children on the spectrum have a lot of issues with threading things. You can do lots of different activities, very low, um, low key activities, threading pasta on string and things like that. So thinking about your craft activities at the end of the story time that help with that fine motor. They often uh, struggle with fine motor skills as well. We also have borrowing kits. So we like to back up the learning of the inclusive and sensitive story times where parents can take a kid home, read a book to them at home and also practice these activities for the next time. So book choices, um, some great book choices, but I think the point um, that I want to make uh, is that it's really important to impress upon the families you're dealing with and the children that they might be different, but they are not less. And I think it's really important not to stereotype with book choices and things, be led by, by the children in your sessions about what they like, what they're enjoying. Um, you can have themes, predictability is really important, telling them what you're going to read next week, if it's going to be trucks or cars, but just like you would structure a normal story time, same sort of thing with your book choices as well. Sometimes it's great, the Tracy Maroney books were my go-to books, which were all about feeling happy and sad because children on the spectrum often struggle with big emotions um, and understanding their emotions as well, but again, I do say don't stereotype, be led by your parents and community that you're dealing with and you will shape up your book choices. Your children's librarians are fantastic for that. So this is like a typical setup. It doesn't cost a lot of money. I think a lot of people think that it is going to cost a lot of money to set up a sensory or inclusive story time kit. We do our schedule boards at every story time, whether we have children on the spectrum or not, we have the aids there for people to use whether they're on the spectrum or not. So we just build these inclusive practices into our everyday story times. And I think that's, that's the feedback we got from parents was they just wanted to be with everyone else and just have those little additional aids there for them if they needed it. And as mentioned in the previous um, presentation, it can help people uh, from cold backgrounds, people that are experiencing deafness and all the rest of it. Social stories are really important. Um, you can make these up the, with the PEX cards or you can actually re use real photos as well. As Jonah got older, I started to take photos of different places. Like if we were going on a plane, I would have photos of the plane and we would take him through stories before it happens. Often behaviour is a symptom of the environment and if the environment's not set up well, but also behaviour comes out in children on the spectrum if they don't know what's going to happen next. So social stories are really useful. Actually, when we go out to kinders and playgroups, we do social stories for all our branches. 
um, saying to children, this is what you can expect when you go to the library. So it's a really useful tool, again, for children on the spectrum, but also children that aren't. So online social stories, we've made an online social story. I've shared the link with Phoebe. We won't share it today because of time, but you can go back and watch that as well. So uh, children on the spectrum are very, very visual. Uh, so it's really important to have visual cues for them and uh, visual aids, having PDFs on your website so people can download a social story before they come. I think Museums Victoria do social stories on their website as well, which is also about teaching kids uh, about the museum before they get there so they can have a really meaningful experience. Real pictures can really help. So um, that's really important and using your children's librarians in your social stories as well. And inclusive story times can be adapted to online. As mentioned again in the previous one, you just do what you do in person, but you can do it online as well, making sure you have all of those elements that you would in person. Certainly coming out of COVID, uh, we're getting a lot of feedback from parents groups. There was a lot of hesitation for having story times and things online for children and, and children being on screens. I can share with you that most children on the spectrum are encouraged to be online because it's how they learn and navigate the world a lot quicker and a lot easier. Um, so pediatricians are saying, get that iPad, get them online, get them experiencing as much as possible. With COVID and all the lockdowns that we've had, um, we've got a lot of kids uh, that have been home for pretty much two years and they're really struggling to come back into society and assimilate. So I think um, we'll find that online story times are here to stay. Um, and we're looking at hybrid models as well. So we're having an in-person event and then streaming our story times and inclusive practices online for those families that are having struggles with their kids coming in. And don't forget our online resources, Storybox uh, Library do fantastic online stories and BorrowBox audiobooks are fantastic for children on the spectrum as well. Sometimes they can have issues reading and print problems, but listening to books is still the way that they can learn, learn and experience um, the, those sorts of resources. I'm going to finish there with timing. I hope that was useful and gave you some um, personal tips from me. Um, I'm going to put in a plug for the Alia conference. I'm actually going to be doing a two hour workshop and go into a whole toolkit, learning resources and some disability awareness training and some fun experiences um, at the conference in May. And also we'll be sharing um, the sensitive Santa model uh, and also inclusive practices for outreach and festivals as well. So thank you so much for your time and I will stop sharing if I can get my screen up. And here we go. Have you got it back now? Kylie, thank you. That was just wonderful. Thanks. And the chat has been going off. Uh, don't worry, everyone, you will get the links. But I do want to hand over to our last speaker today, and that's Joe. So take it away, please, Joe. All right, thank you. I'm just going to get my screen up. Hold on, I've got to share. Um, okay. Um, before I do, I just wanted to say, Kylie, thank you so much. Um, that was great. And it... Um, it just ties into so much of the research I've done in that space. Um, and everything in there is so beautiful. I, I used to, and I know I'm going to take up a little time here, but I used to um, refer to, um, and I still do, my um, sensitive story times as a bridge. So I always saw it as a bridge for those children who need that opportunity to develop confidence, whatever, and then they move into the uh, more traditional story times. Um, and the number of families who have come back to me and said, that was it, that was perfect. And even children who used that as a bridge to actually uh, when they started school. Um, because just even sitting, we, we, know, we know that just for kids being able to sit is one of the core things that is required of them in a classroom. So 
um, yeah, so thank you and beautiful. Um, and it is actually a little bit of a segue for me to kind of now say, right, everything Kylie said is wonderful. So now let's have a look at some tips and tricks for trying to move that online. Um, and if we consider in many ways, I see the online story times as pretty much that social story time. So this is the opportunity for so many families to uh, expose their children to the um, in-person story times. And whether that child has autism on the spectrum, whether they're just a very shy child, a lot of the times, um, and. Uh, children are not necessarily diagnosed or do not receive a diagnosis for a very long time and um, but their but their families are still dealing with um, with helping those children without that diagnosis so I guess what I'm saying is consider your online story times also from that perspective consider what they actually are able to do for those families who whether it be through COVID or whatever um, can't come into the library and or use that as an opportunity to build what they need to um, to make that leap into the on on in person space. So I'm very excited to talk to you about this. So thank you very much. Um, the other thing I do want to impress before I sort of get into this is that. Accessible story times are really important, not just from the perspective of the social stories, which I've just spoken about, but also because it's actually the law. So once again, we get back to that perspective of um, did the Disability Discrimination Act of 1992. Now that act, that law actually mandates that um, all of um, the services, the online services that organisations, businesses, et cetera, provide are accessible. So there is in fact a, an act which covers that and um, library services are included in that. So whatever organisation you are, whatever business you are, whatever you do, you have to provide your online services in an accessible format. Um, and if you don't, there is, you know, basically there is the potential that somebody could come and say, well, hold on, this is the law, you do actually need to provide this. So be aware of that. Um, and the Australian government actually recommend the use of what's called the web content accessibility guidelines. And I do have a link to that in my reference page at the end. So it's the web content accessibility guidelines and the Australian government recommend that people use that. Okay, so I'm going to try and get through this. Um, where's my button? All right, so what is an accessible video or an accessible story time? It's um, one that everyone can watch and enjoy, including people with disabilities um, who may be unable to hear the audio or unable to see the image as well on the screen. So this means that the auditory experience of the video must give all of that essential information that that person will need um, to be able to um, enjoy it still. Similarly, um, if the um, just so just as the visual experience needs to provide everything that somebody who has a hearing impairment um, has. So and, and the reality is that we actually often do a lot of this already in our story times when we're presenting them face to face. Because we pick up on the cues, we pick up on who's having trouble understanding um, something in that story time, we pick up you know, there are a lot more clues that we can pick up on in that sort of face-to-face um, -face experience. But um, in the online environment, we don't have that. So we have to be far more deliberate in our delivery and far more deliberate in making sure that we're providing our delivery in, an, in, an, in as an accessible way as possible. So really um, being really deliberate and mindful of that because you would be surprised at what you do already when you're, when you're dealing with that um, child in front of you. So you can achieve that by um, 
using captions, by using audio description, which is when you're describing what you are doing um, and what's in the book that you're reading, um, how you're doing things, um, by um, perhaps providing a transcript um, and making sure that you're using an accessible media platform. And I'm going to talk about that um, in a little bit. Um, and many of you or some of you might recall in an earlier presentation, I also talked about actually having a go at watching your online story time either without the sound and seeing how much you can um, follow and understand and or without the visuals and once again seeing how much you miss out on so that gives you a really um, you know a good idea of what somebody who may be having difficulties in those areas um, experiences when they view your story times so um, the categories of disability that I've listed on the screen there can have a significant impact on the individual's ability to access an online program. So, for example, we've got visual, obviously, we, you know, we've got blindness, but we've also got colour blindness. We've got low vision, we've got photosensitivity and tracking difficulties. Um, auditory, we've got um, hearing impairment, um, and, we, and then we've got people who are sensitive to a range of different um, noises. So it's really that awareness of that, and I'll go into that in a little bit as well. But you know, a, um, sensitive to a really high pitch noise or um, something like that. Mobility, um, such as fine motor skills or um, people who may have cerebral palsy or even arthritis. Now, these can actually really impact your ability to use your computer to access your information. So I'll go into that in a little bit, but just how important it is to make your online story times easily accessible via the computer. So. Oh, and then cognitive and learning disabilities such as, um, you know, autism, um, ADD, uh, executive functioning, um, a whole range of different areas. So let's have a really quick look at um, the different elements of an online story time through the lens of these disabilities. So I want to start with uh, book selection. Diversity. And I know Kylie touched a little bit about, upon this. Um, stories written about and by people um, with disabilities, but these stories need to be positive. They need to be non-ableist, destigmatizing. So look for books where the protagonist has a disability, but that disability is not the focus at all of the book. So think, you know, look at having a real diversity within your book selection. Colour contrast. So people who have low vision often need high contrast that differentiate the text and the illustrations from the background of the book. Um, also avoid using books where colour is the only way that you can identify something. So instead, um, use ones where there are both colour and shape. So that way you could say, oh, look for the red triangle. So obviously if they're colour blind, they can look for the triangle shape and vice versa. So just that sort of awareness around that. Um, and, uh, you know, this contrast thing is one of the biggest bugbears I have particularly when I, I look at flyers that are produced and websites. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Really be mindful of that contrast. And I guess a real classic example I want to give you is one of my daughters has a beautiful friend who has um, vision impairment. When she comes to our house, she cannot pick out our dog's face. So she can see the dog's head, but she can't differentiate between the dog's eyes, the dog's nose um, and the dog's mouth because our dog is black. It's all black. So if you have really muted colours there, um, it, you know, you're not going to see that colour contrast. So you're not going to see things pop out at you. Um, one of the biggest problems people always do is they put white on something like grey or oh, anyway. Okay, um, consider how 
the book will look on film. This is again really important. So glossy pages give a, a you know give a significant glare on your screen. Some illustrations can actually appear quite blurry on the screen. So look for books which are vibrant, um, have really clear illustrations, and have that contrast. Um, are the illustrations and the size of the text large enough to actually share them on a screen? Consistent layout. So it's easy, you know, it's much easier for children to follow when the illustrations and the text are in the same places on the page. So the child's not sort of looking all around the page trying to work out, oh, where's the text going to be this time or where's the picture going to be this time? So it's that sort of consistency. Um, choose books, and this is another really useful one, choose books that allow for the use of props to help with that understanding of the content. Um, and, you know, a lot of the times you might do that already face to face, but make an extra effort to do that in an online environment, demonstrate it with props, retell the story with props. Um, because as I said, um, that comprehension can be a lot harder in uh, that online environment. All right, so session content. So use multiple means of, for audience engagement. And that's where I was talking about with those props and the retelling of the story. So adapt songs and rhymes also that children and families with a wide range of motor abilities can participate in or um, suggest other ways. So for example, instead of just saying stamp your feet, you might be able to say stamp your feet or nod your head or blink your eyes. So think of a range of ways that a child can participate so that you're covering um, hopefully, you know, as many ways as possible. Use different voices for the characters so that the children can help under, um, so you help the children understand who's speaking in the story. Use um, tactile elements and bring those into your story time. Make sure that you provide a list of um, supplies that the family might need and make sure they're typical household items. So scarves, maybe pots and pans, um, a colander or something. So, you know, think about what's tactile that you need for that story, provide that little list and make sure it's, you know, the families can find it in the house. Structure and organisation, everyone has said use that visual story time schedule, do that. Um, and I think it was, um, uh, I think it was Marlene maybe who said this, make sure you use the same format each session, start with the same opening and the same closing and don't change versions of songs, use the same version every time. Um, otherwise it creates confusion. We're all, this is all coming back to that predictability, let your audience know what's going to happen, exactly when it's going to happen um, and, and talk them through that. We're going to read this story and then we're going to sing our song. Um, forward, you know, plan all of those transitions for your, for your listeners so that they really can um, have that have that time to um, process that. Okay. Uh, presentation. So again, think about visuals. This again is be mindful of strobing, mindful of visual disturbances. Um, in fact, what people um, may not be aware of is quite often when you have one of those fake um, background screens, they can actually create a visual disturbance for people. And quite often they have this sort of fuzziness around it or something like that. So just be really mindful uh, if you are going to use a background, um, the fake backgrounds, have a good look. Does that create any problems on your screen? Um, use solid backgrounds that contrast with your clothes. Avoid um, wearing busy patterns, um, things like that. So just, you know, trying to really create that sort of calm, less busy um, environment. Movement, and I'm probably the worst at this, avoid um, flashing or loud content or sudden movements. Um, so 
Stay in one spot as much as you can. Slow down your motion so that they're easier to track. And I know I do have my hands going all over the place. Um, but really, you're trying to reduce that busy, rushed feeling um, so that when it's live streamed, it, it, it's not competing with what, what story you're reading or whatever. So cut out all those other you know, competitive things around the edges, like background noise. Remove background noise as much as possible. Um, I think Kylie or somebody's mentioned this one as well, processing time, slow down your reading. And I know I'm going as fast as I possibly can right here. So I'm breaking all of my own rules. Pause and build in at least a seven to 10 second time. Give, give your audience that wait time. It's actually much harder doing that in an online environment. We're much better at doing it face to face because we, we can just see the face of the, our audience thinking. Um, you've got to consciously try and do it in an online um, environment. Captions um, and song lyrics. Remember, you actually have adults in your audience as well. So put the song lyrics up, put those captions up because you've got adults um, who may need them as well. Okay, technology. Um, the sort of technology you need is also really important. So internet access, and I think I spoke about this before, is your program accessed through your library web page? Really simplify the paths to accessing that program. Reduce the number of clicks. Remember the three click rule. Honestly, if it's more than three clicks, gone, forget it. If you have to go through so many gateways, people are not going to do it and it's going to create confusion. Um, be aware that if your user, and mainly here I'm talking about your adults, but if they accidentally get kicked out of the program or exit the program or their child accidentally exits the program, how easy is it going to be for them to get back in? And that comes back to where I was talking about before, where you have got um, uh, family members who may also have arthritis, who may have cerebral palsy, who may themselves have um, fine motor skill difficulties. So um, whilst it, whilst I'm saying, you know, it's an inclusive and accessible story time for children, remember the families, you're, you're catering for that whole family and the um, think about the grandmas who may actually, grandmas and grandpas who may have that child for that morning. Damn, you better make it easy to access because grandma's not going to be able to go through five hoops to get there. Um, accessible platforms. This is pretty much what I was just chatting about, but make sure that your platform has, um, allows for keyboard access so they don't just have to use a mouse. Make sure they can use their keyboard to get in and do different things in there. Make sure that the video doesn't automatically play. Make sure the user has the power to pace their own experience to start and stop the story time as they want to. Um, using captioning and audio description, does the platform support multiple orientations? So can it be landscape and can it be horizontal? Have a think about that as well. And can the platform be um, used by people who have adaptive and assistive technology? Do your research into that and make sure it's accessible with that. If you do, and I do recommend that you use captions, make sure that as much as possible, they appear at the same time as the person speaking. So, you know, you haven't got that too far out of sync. Um, make sure it captures other audio information, like someone laughing or, um, you know, crying or something like that. So you've got that little, um, caption coming up saying crying, whatever, um, that the captions appear on the screen long enough to be easily read, um, that you avoid, that the captions don't actually block really important visuals on your screen. Um, again, colour contrast, don't have white captions on a white background, no one's going to see it. So make sure your captions are contrasted really nicely against the background. Um, 
they're provided in multiple languages. Think about your audience. Why can't they actually read it in their own language? Um, that's pretty much it. Um, but I guess all of this comes down to what, and I'll just go on to my next page so you can see my references there. Um, pretty much we're looking at the concepts of universal design and like um, uh, Marlene and Andrea said at the very beginning, whatever you do for one group of people is honestly going to be a benefit to everyone. Um, you may not, I don't know if you know this statistic, but it blew me away. 75% of all Facebook videos are watched um, without sound. 75% are watched without sound. So there's a hell of a lot of people who really need to, for whatever reason, or want to, for whatever reason, watch things um, in, in different, uh, different ways. So just be aware of that. And you don't have to do this all at once. You honestly don't. Just do one thing at a time. Bring in one little thing. Once you've got that under your belt, bring in another one. Um, and as Kylie said, um, I honestly think, and we're, we are also looking at just doing all of our story time sessions hybrid because it meets a need for um, a, a range of people and I, I don't think we're ever actually going to go back to just being in person and I don't think that's the most accessible and inclusive way of libraries um, doing story time services. Um, and one more little um, thing which continually comes back to my mind um, when I was researching and I was chatting with um, a lovely mum and she said to me that it takes her 20 minutes to um, move her child from the car to her wheelchair using the lifting equipment required. And then obviously 20 minutes, the reverse. Now that's a lot, that's 40 minutes just to come to the story time. She's not going to come every week. She may, you know, she's going to want to come, but she won't want to come every week. So what we can provide for all of our families, um, yeah, it's going to be fantastic. So um, thank you. And hopefully there was one or two little things that you can take away from that. Oh, Joe, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And look, I want to thank all of our speakers, right through from Nadia and her team, um, the acknowledgement of country. I know that my library has just developed an age appropriate um, acknowledgement of country. I'm happy to share that with you. So just ask through Phoebe. Um, the visual schedules for story times, how wonderful, because that's like an agenda. And you know what we're all like when we can see the agenda and we know how much further we've got to go through the meeting. Um, and Kylie, thank you for sharing your personal story and the why, um, and also the visual timer. That was fantastic. And I know that there was a question about the visual timer. So I want to thank the earlier staff for answering a lot of the questions on the fly. So that's all done really well. And Joe, just making us aware of the Disability, Disability Discrimination Act. Of course, that is something that we can fall back on and uh, justify why we need to be doing this really amazing work. And, you know, the web content accessibility guidelines, I'll definitely be pointing my organisation that way as well. I have to say, sadly, we don't have time for questions. If you do have questions, please email them through to Phoebe, who will ask the panellists, and they'll be sent out to all of you afterwards. A link to this recording will also be sent out to you, and I'm going to hand back to Phoebe. Thanks very much. Thank you, Vicky. Um, that's a really, really rich session and just what I was hoping to bring together. Um, it's been lots of theory and lots of content as well as some really practical tools and ideas that um, hopefully you'll be able to um, bring into the online story time community as you're making your recordings. As Joe said, just take a little and then a little more. Um, so thank you once again, Nadia, Kylie, Joe and Vicky for talking to us today and to Andrea and Mali for their presentation and to all of you for sharing your experience and expertise. Um, and thank you for everyone who could join us today. Um, I'll be sending all registrants the recording link later today or tomorrow. And 
We'll be back for a third uh, webinar in February 2022, the focus of which will again be under the umbrella of the diversity theme, and it will be about creating online story times with Auslan interpretation. So of course, if you have any questions or comments, do get in touch with me at phoebe.weston-evans at alia.org.au. And until the next time, thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day.